It looked like Niagara fell ahead to where you could see a wall of water. Now, on this ship, we had three places you could navigate from. You can navigate from a bridge, which is off gone. You can navigate from a secondary con here, or you can navigate from the steering engine room, steer. You have gyro repairs and all those stations, and compasses and stuff like that. And what they did, they put a shelter on top of this number three and number four gun shelter, and that was to protect the wheel when, that was when the officer were attacking stuff like that, so they wouldn't get wet when it rained. Uh, we found out it was seaworthy, safe enough to go back to the States. That was about a 2,500-mile trip. And we ran in room with a convoy of seven ships and two other destroyers. The two other destroyers escorted us. Andy and Simpson, you have a call on 8 Andy, you have a call on 8 I'll be right there. Uh, we took up the rear of the convoy because we didn't have any sound here. We navigate with a magnetic compass, and we had four or five officers off the battleship. Right? Well, they were on a battleship. They are nothing but messenger boys. They carried messages around for the ab on a skipper, guys like that. They couldn't navigate with a magnetic compass. We go to general quarters. In the evening, a half hour before sunset, or half hour after sunset. And we go to general quarters in the morning, a half hour before sunrise, or half hour after sunrise. That's the most crucial time of being hit with a torpedo, because you can be silhouetted between a enemy submarine and the sun coming up or the moon coming up. So you wake up in the morning, general quarters, be on a gun, you rub your eyes and look all around. Nobody here out there all alone. Convoy's over over the hill. These guys will lose a convoy during the night. <laughs> we didn't care. We were headed stateside. You know, we were about to enter some liberty, good liberty. So we made that trip in about seven days. We pulled into Frisco, and he tied us up to another ship. And the old man, the skipper, he wanted to go right up to Bell Island. He had his car on a fantail, all freighted up. And he got off the ship, no security engines. He went to a phone, and he got permission to go up to Bell Island. And we went up there pretty fast, 15, 18 knots. And we pulled in the next to the ship in Frisco. They looked at us, and we didn't, they didn't know who we were. They thought we were a foreign ship that was captured or something. They said, well, you look at that, you don't look, don't look like an American ship, does it? But anyway, it was fine. We had an open galley, which is unusual on a destroyer. You only have open galley on submarines. Don't make anything you want, any time of the day or night. We had open galley. This was a treat nuts. Now that's that's alongside here in Maryland Navy Yard, which is 30 miles up the bay from San Francisco. Here's that, here's that shelter I told you about to protect the, the navigator, it's officer at deck and look out watch and stuff like that. So, uh, we're going to run it at Rhinoc. Okay. They started rebuilding the shore. As soon as they decided they were going to sell it. And they started back in their route from the stem post. We're dead. Because they didn't know what freight we were damaged to. And there's, that, there's the work that they were working on. We were coming to us. We're in dry dock. We're going to pump that water out. Cut this jury power off. Split the dry dock again. Pull us over. And line us up. And they ran a new pier back underneath the engine room for additional support. 
Bally cut off. Fourth of July of 42. We got recommissioned. And very, very extensive coverage in all the Pittsburgh papers. This ship was resurrected from the dead. The Navy played that up pretty good. Yeah. It was going to put salt in the Japanese wounds. So. Came back Rowan. They're probably all, probably all finished there. And there's some fitting out alongside of Peter. And this is where we're. All right. Hold, hold the mic down a little bit. Just, just a little bit like that. Is it tough? No, it's garbled. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Now hear this. <laughs> Let's have a close ship down for you. Huh? I want a picture of the ship completed, right? There it is. We're going out on sea trials out in Frisco Bay to see how it will handle. Put hard left, right, right, right. see how much this, see how it would come back. So forth and so on. We did that two or three days and we went out there to see and cranked it up 32, 35 knots. When they found out they were satisfied with the work, we got the pineapple run. That was real gravy duty. That was convoy ships from San Francisco to Honolulu. I made that trip in five days. I made that trip in 21 days. When you're out there with a bucket of bullets that can do only five knots, and that's a 21-day trip, and you know you can do it in five days, it powers the hell out of you, you know? So, we made, we made convoy duty up to, back, up to around the 15th of October. We pulled into Pearl Harbor, and we took on provisions, fuel, ammunition. We turned around. We had a way too waiting for a big task force. It was shot down. We didn't know we were going to be in it. And we got guard mail, which is sealed stuff. You got to pass from one ship to another. It's highly secret. And we caught up with them three or four days later. And on the 26th of October was the Battle of Santa Cruz. That was air versus air. The enemy ships were 200 miles apart. So what ship crashed? Number two to uh, USS Smith. South Dakota. Same day the South Dakota shot down 32 planes and became known as Battleship X. And we pulled that on the day. Mm -hmm. Meantime, the USS Porter. Okay. Yeah. Uh, USS Porter pulled out of formation to pick up a torpedo pump battle crew. Grand crew. The hydraulic gear was shot out, and they couldn't lower the landing gear to land on the carrier. They didn't think they'd give them a drink. They, that USS Porter no sooner stopped, when the flight her over the side, with a three-man on the board, when it took a torpedo, it split the back up between two fires. The last skipper pulls out a screen position without even asking permission. He was subject to a court martial for this. He left a, a capital ship unprotected. That's a no-no. He went back, we went alongside that porter, 
the rest of the crew. We had a bow line and a star line, of course. And poor me, I'm up in number one magazine. Sending up five inch shells of powder. I hear <laughs> outside the hall. Most of these guys, some of them, were up from Washington, Oregon, the whole ice cream. I said, what was that? He said, that's a fish going across the bow. You can hear it. You can hear it, because that hose only five, six inches of that stick. I'm looking around, there's a guy down there supposed to be handling shells. He was only reading a comic book. This guy was unconscious. <laughs> so, when that submarine was shooting torpedoes at us, the skipper says, chop the lines. And you had fire actors that were pretty sharp. You could shave with them. They chopped the lines. He said, in the corner there, she'll give me some speed. They wound up flank ahead. And when those guys down in the engine room got that bell flank ahead, they spun the throttles open, and that ship took off like an outdoor motor boat. The screws bit in, went, the rear end went down, and there were no runs on this. They were pulling away. About five feet apart. Flying it. Because that pushes out and grabs it. the top one, the span of the light line on the shore. Plus his hat and scrambled legs. And they helped him aboard. He was destroyed the code books, the radio equipment. And the sad part of this story is we had to leave the wounded on there. We couldn't take them off. This is one of the horrors of war. Because you can't sacrifice the crew of what ship and the remainder of the crew of the poor to save four or five people. But we fired torpedoes at that the second, so it wouldn't fall into the hands of the enemy. Friends of the world Duds. You probably all know we had fallen torpedoes for two and a half years. You couldn't convince Washington that they were falling. Some skippers did everything in the power, even stood court marshals, to try to correct the problem. And one of the guys that was in there and designing this torpedo works perfect. They learned how to fire. And they found out what was wrong. And it took two and a half years. And I often think of the subscripters that took these screw submarines off the coast of Japan with 90 guys on them and fired 20 or 22 torpedoes at ships. You could see through a periscope where this torpedo hit the side of the ship and it splat. Japanese, we stayed there looking over the lifeline left. I got photographs about this stuff. Yeah. So we had to sink this ship with gunfire. Five inch shells. We had that crew aboard for three days. And they were sleeping all over the deck. And you stand watches, you relieve the watch every four hours. At midnight, 4 a.m., you were walking on top of people to go down the issue when you stand your watch. You couldn't find anybody. Couldn't turn a flashlight on or nothing. We had them for three days. They put us on two meals a day to make the food last, which we didn't, we didn't care. We didn't mind it. We rescued the crew. You got the one on the transfer of the guys that are just south the Dakota? Yes, sir. Okay, we had this crew. In addition to the shark crew, the board for three days. And look, they, they, they decided the best thing to do was to transfer these guys one at a time in a preacher's board, and that's what's taking place here. That's the that's starboard side of the shore, 
And this is a South Dakota. It took us about five hours to transfer these guys. We're going to cross this line here. Here's a power line. It's tied to the shore and to the South Dakota to try to keep them at a certain distance. And they rode a boat's chair across here one at a time. I don't know how many guys we had. It took about four hours. We were glad to get rid of them. Because we had some place to walk without stepping on bodies, you know? So I'm up in the, I'm up in the last quarter of 42. I'm supposed to talk about Pearl Harbor. So, tell me for, what would it come tell you? Okay. Huh? Fascinated? Are you spellbound? I told you to bring a safety belt. They wouldn't slide off the chair. <laughs> All right, this is the 26th of October. We lost the Porter, we swear, and we lost the USS Hornet. That's the one deal that took off of the bomb Tokyo on April of 42. They were gunning for this for a long time, and they finally nailed it this day. And it took them, what, April, was, April or October, which is seven, eight months, six months? Anyway, this is our third carrier we lost. We lost the first one in a Carl C. battle in April of 42. That was the Lexington. The next one was in June of 42 in the Battle of Midway, June 6th. That was in Yorktown. The third was a loss. That got sunk off of Battle of Canal. The hardest to foot. We had two other carriers afloat, and the Japanese never knew it. In San Antonio, every time it stuck his nose outside the boat water, it would get a torpedo. I don't want to be a member of that fire room crew or engine room crew. They never got a chance to find out their first name. We had, the only, the only car we had was the Enterprise, which was known as the Big E, and it became to be known as the Galvin Ghost, the Oahu Coast. We reached a step through Enterprise up there through the oceans, and Japanese submarines on their continents would spot it in and out of the fog bank and beat out a message to Tokyo, carrier task force up off the oceans. It would make a high speed run down the Hawaii waters, Japanese submarine on patrol there. Power force, or Ferrari. They couldn't figure out how they shipped by our so fast. Then it would be chased out of the Central Pacific, and it would be pulled there, they figured. Yeah, we got more than one or two carriers. There's four here, yeah? You never knew. But the big A, the Enterprise, was a backbone of the Pacific fleet. I want to make a statement here about the Battle of Midway. Historians will tell you the Battle of Midway was the deciding battle of World War II. No, it wasn't. The only, know, the only thing historians know is what they're told by somebody else. Unless they were there and witnessed it. What happened in Midway in June of 42 was we broke the back of the Japanese carrier force. And we four sunk and two or three damaged. We invaded Gallup Canal on August the 7th, 42. And we lost 26 ships out there on a body of water called Iron Bottom Bay. That's a stretch of water about 80 miles long, 30 or 40 miles wide. And one side was Guadalcanal, right in Carolina, about 40 miles away, was Floor Island, which where Tawagi was. Up at the northern end was a rock sticking out of the water called Sable Island. The Japs always come in between Sailor Island and the Bar Canal side. We always come in the lower side. 
I don't know how to do it, how to play with the story up there at picket duty between several hours and four hours in case they decided to forget that one. And we had that duty a couple of nights. And I tell you, it's an awful lousy film. Because if they decide to come in that way, it's so on top. You know? Every time the Air Force will open up at you, and your job was to alert the main battle force down the line. So that's the story on Midway. You cannot go what you read in the history books. Go by what you read in the history books. Because there were seven or eight battles that took place north of Guadalajara Canal from August to December of 42, where we were using cruisers for battleships mm. and we were using destroyers for cruisers. One night, a couple of jet wagons were made. You can't pull in these guys and get 16 inch guns. What you have to do is stop them. You send four or five tin cans in there to make a torpedo run. Foul up the rudder, foul up the screws, so you can't use any speed or maneuver. I learned by what went on out there in battles I was in by watching the history channel. They don't tell you anything about what goes on. Everything's a tactical victory. Now it died. That's one of their favorite expressions. Get the hell beat out of here. Five or six ships sunk. It was a tactical victory. That's what happened at a battle of the Carl C. We stopped an invasion by going into Port Moresby, our lowest shiny New Guinea. They got it there, they would go 30 miles across to Port Darwin, and they had an anchor in Australia. This is why we had to invade Wild Out. Patrol planes spotted the plane, the airfield being built. And <coughs> patrol bombers taken off of that airfield to sever our lifeline between San Francisco, Hawaii, Australia, and New Zealand. It was around a perimeter. It was around a defense line. And when they, they went in there on the 7th of August, they didn't lose a man hitting the beaches. They caught them with surprise. Nobody told me there's 52 ships up out there in this Sea Lock Channel, which we refer to as our bottom bay. It's supposed to be 26 of ours and 26 of theirs. There's over 5,500 sailors out there. That was a battle of attrition. Who was going to give up first? And thank God, we, they gave up. They gave up. We controlled the air. They couldn't come in at daytime. They come in at night. We lost an awful lot of ships at night, night battles. Why? We weren't trained in night battle tactics. They had an excellent torpedo called the Long Lance. It sunk a lot of ships in our Navy, it's our bottom bay. And I want to tell you, I'm still suffering anguish in my head from that place out there. Clinton says, well, that was registered with the VA. I decided, well, I better go sign up, see what they got to say. What a change. I was down there in 45 or 46, and they look at me and say, what do you want? You're breaking up our checker game. You're a pinochle game. You're an artist. What a change. What a change. I couldn't believe it. This counselor's interviewing me. And I'm telling her about the thing that happened. She said, is there anything else bothering you? <laughs> I sat there and I thought, and thought, and thought. Oh, Brown, it's about time you aired your laundry. I said, yes. She said, what is it? 
He said, there's things on my mind every awakened moment. By the time I get up, by the time I go to bed. I can't erase it. He says, I go to work, I work on a piece of machinery. I'm concentrating on what I'm doing on this piece of machinery. But deep back in my mind, I will for Guadalupe out. He said, she, she fixed me up with a psychiatrist, and I had an interview with him. Yeah. I said, what's your preliminary diagnosis? He says, you've got delayed action syndrome. Well, right then and there, I think, well, the Vietnam veterans. Because they're the ones that exposed this. The United States Army, the United VA. In World War I, it was called shell shock. They didn't do nothing for them poor guys. You see some of these movies from World War I or History Channel, I'd be kind of, I like to fight a war like that. Water up to your knees in a trench, rats running around, over the top, right, going through barbed wire. It was when they collected me. World War II was called combat fatigue. Ain't that the wrong with you? You're sick in the head, though. World well, Korean War, combat fatigue. And this is one thing I admire the Vietnam, Vietnam veterans for. They come back and they exposed this. And they found out what delayed action syndrome is. And it's hard, very hard, to get rid of it. I carried that excess baggage around for over 50 years. And when you stop and think, what was causing this? Makes you feel pretty stinky. Your wife suffers for this. Your kids suffer for this. You're not a normal person. I take a medication, working 90 percent. I'm kicking my rear end because I didn't do something earlier about this. So we're up to 42. Have enough yet? You promise I'll, I'll come back and finish up World War II for you. <laughs> Four o'clock. Four o'clock, you got half an hour. Half an hour? Maybe, maybe like. You can go for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, first of all, thank you. We can't, we can't yeah. really thank you enough for what you've done and what you're telling us. First of all, I want to explain to all you folks, I'm not a hero. I had a job to do. I didn't like it, but I did it to the best of my ability. I was in several eight battles out there. And when we went on the offensive, in June of 44, we were fighting a delay action and a war of attrition all of 42, most of 43. We were advancing from the Marshall Islands, the Mariana Islands, which is about 12, 1,500 miles away. I come out of the engine room, off a watch at 4 o'clock. My head went up above this combing. I looked down on the port side. All I could see was ships. I looked over on the starboard side. All I could see was ships. Where the hell did they get all these ships all at once? There's about 80 or 100 ships in this invasion fort. And we're going to hit Saipan with the 2nd and 4th Marine Division. We were supposed to hit Guam 10 days later with the 3rd Division. But the second and fourth ran into such stiff opposition. They had to throw the third in there to back them up. And we used to have night elimination duty. We fired star shells from two guns five minutes apart. And they would, they would shoot up behind the jet lines, and the flares would come floating down on a parachute. 
this would silhouette the Japanese in case they were ready for the Banzai attack. But one night, I couldn't find any place to sleep. I slept under this number three gun. I had my shoes for a pillow. And every 10 minutes, this five-inch gun would go off. <laughs> I was bad. <laughs> They, I, I get no respect, you know. <laughs> but when you stop and think of the poor guys over at Island, every once in a while the wind would shift. And the other of these decaying bodies would come out to sea. And you think, my God, how did they put up with this? They're going through this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. How do they, how do they cope with this odor? I want to be a Marine. I'm too chicken. <laughs> so, I left the shore in about October of 44. I finally got orders from the Bureau of Personnel and went back to sub school. We went in Connecticut. People say submarines. I said, yeah. I was going to be stateside for 16 weeks. <laughs> Six weeks basic submarine school, ten weeks diesel school. I'll be like a hard one weekend. See my folks. After that, I don't care what happened. I don't care what happened. Fortunately, I got sent to a large boat. Yes, sir. Paul, I know you're proud of the shore. You did some submarine duty, if you haven't mentioned it, I guess I haven't heard it. Oh. And the other thing, question I have is, Franklin Roosevelt, I knew you had some ideas about him. He sold us up the river. <laughs> you, John? Is that a turmoil outside this big time? This is supposed to be about Pearl Harbor. That's one day. I got you up to 44, and I, come, I, was, I wasn't on submarine yet. I left the shore off the block and come back. I started at sub school up New London in November of 44. I got 10 days leave. I gave a kid five bucks, and I says, let me know what draft list I'm on. They're sending me to the Pacific. I'm going over the hill. I'll desert. But I'm not going back there anymore. I know what it's like. He called me up on the phone. He says, you're on a draft in Key West, Florida. That was the old art boats. I break one sound school ships down there. You dive down, and it will paint on you all day, the sun arm, and every once in a while, it would send down a message, base course and speed. And you're sitting in a control room saying, what the hell's wrong with these people? They know where we're at. And you send another message down, base course and speed. After the third or fourth message I sent down here, I said, we got another contact bearing so-and-so. You, you put an air bubble in a, in a torpedo tube and shot it up to the surface. And they would say, all well, clear surface, and that left you come up. And see, if they told you that they had another contact bearing so-and-so, you would have come up there the first time. <laughs> we were playing games. But it was that a day I wished I was back in the Pacific on a fleet type submarine because the art boats is a real sword type navy. And I swore to God that I had TB when I got off the hip me. All the exhaust elbows on the edges, leak, exhaust, was so scopy in the engine, you had to go like this to your gauges and see what your pressures were. That's why I celebrated BJ Day. I got shipped back to New London, got reprocessed. They sent me down to 
New Orleans, to the USS Sierra. And I'm telling you, we went up the Mississippi River to Baton Rouge, the capital of Louisiana, for Navy Day 45. And I could not believe my eyes that I was riding up the Mississippi River on a submarine with six years at sea, you know? <laughs> but the pilot we had was a Coast Guard officer, and he really knew the twist and turn to that river. He, he had one screw going two-thirds of head, the other one he'd kick it in reverse, two-thirds of stern, he swing the ass into that submarine around, and he'd put a ball head two-thirds, off we go. So I spent Navy Day 45 at that, that told the J, as they call it, that told the result with that French accent. I'll talk that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> service at night. Suppose it was heavily mined. The Japanese changed the minefield around and they were coming through the streets and they hit a mine. They didn't know they, they weren't aware of this. So everybody on the bridge got blown off, the submarine sunk, and they swam ashore to some island and they were captured. Along come Horsley from Task Force 58, and he bombs the hell out of this island. And the Japs got scared. These prisoners from the submarine were on the second floor of this building, and they used to see a GI down here sweeping a patio every morning. And they dropped a note down to him, and that note went back to Australia. That's how they know what happened to these guys. They got scared when Horsley bombed the hell out of this island. They were. They got a bulldozer and built, dug a trench. They threw all them guys in there, poured gasoline on them, and set a match to them. That's what happened now on Kimmel's son. And he was a victim of circumstances. He was railroaded. 
I can't understand why his fellow officers declared him guilty of a dereliction of duty. I can't understand. Who was responsible for the FDR. Yeah, I'm trying to say something. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to say a bit about that. Well, I'll touch on it lightly. We were we had radio navy operators on Guam, Great, Kavini, and Pearl Harbor, copying their frequencies 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They were being flown back to Washington the Navy intelligence to get decoders. Limeys were copying them in Singapore. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Our they were copying these in Singapore and sent them to London. Now we had three decoding machines and could decipher these messages. There was one in Navy Intelligence in Washington. The father took one to Manila when he went out there as a field marshal. A lot of you here don't know he was a field marshal. He left the continent of Lebanon to the United States. He was a field marshal for the Philippine Army. And I'm going to tell you something. That man was an egotist. He was an egomaniac. He wanted to control the world. And they got rid of him out of Washington because Roosevelt was scared of him. That's the ship of the, the Manila. The other machine, Churchill, talked Roosevelt into it. They had it in London. Adolf Hitler, Churchill, and everybody else knew the attack was coming two weeks before it happened. Who do you want me to blame it on? A gifty old leg old man with no spencer glasses and a felt hat. I ain't got no time. I thought he was the greatest guy in the world. He did a lot for the working man. And Social Security passed. He started the CCCs, the kids that were out of work. He started the WPA. Where did he get them ideas from? Anybody know? Norman Thomas. Yeah. Some Norman Thomas. He got it from Adolf Hitler. That's where he got it from. What do you think started the Pennsylvania Turnpike from Pittsburgh to? Harrisburg, the Autobahn. He got a lot of ideas from Hitler. Go look it up in the books and find out I'm right. Because the CCC camps gave these young guys a place to sleep, three meals a day, and he got a few bucks for them in their pocket. Plus they learned discipline. And things were tough back in them days. I wonder the depression boys. I ate turnips every night. One night they'd be diced, put salt on. Next night they were mashed, you put pepper on. Why did you eat turnips? Because they were cheaper than potatoes. You didn't growl about it. You were good. You walk out the, the front door, go to school, you see a guy from up the street going to work, and you say, good morning, Mr. So-and-so. Hi, how are you? They don't do that anymore today. You say hello to somebody and they think you're crazy. They drive. I don't know how this guy When I give talks to kids at school, I always remind them there's two words in the vocabulary. It doesn't cost you nothing to use these two words. But it means an awful lot to the person receiver. They look at you dumbfounded. Do I know what the words are? Please and thank you. It don't cost you anything to say that. You gotta smile once in a while. I don't know how to smile. My head screwed up with one on canal. I don't smile. A lot of people don't know why I don't, why I don't smile. I could care less. But don't look at me as a hero. We fought a losing war in 42 and 43 out here. We didn't have nothing to fight with. Them. 
Yes, sir. Isn't it true we were on anti-sabotage alert and that all the planes at Hickam Field were taken out of the revetments and put onto the airfield? Don't I'll complain put about them planes at Hickam Field. Huh? Don't complain about them planes at Hickam Field. I won't. Go out to Clarksville in the Philippines. Yeah. Dug out Doug, the Garthur, at over 12 hours notice. Pearl Harbor was bombed because of the international date line. His planes were all lined up. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any planes in the air on patrol duty. That made sure of the court martial. Yeah. You ever realize that if you took the P in Paul and put it in front of Earl, it comes out to Pearl? <laughs> <laughs> And do you know the whole number, 373, you add it together, your whole name has 13 letters in it. <laughs> you never, you never realize that. You I know that 373 totals up to 13. What's that? 373 totals up to 13. Yeah, 13. You got 13 letters in your name. That was a hard luck shoot you in here. I'm <laughs> <laughs>